Hello, 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 YouTube world. I'm so excited to be here today. Hold on one second. Let me just get my microphone tightened down there. Hi, guys. Oh, I'm so excited to be here today with you. We've got so much to talk about. Um, so I see Denise is in here. Hi, Denise. Thanks for joining. When you come in, just uh, give me a little hi or a wave or something to let me know you guys are here while I'm waiting for everybody to filter in. Um, I want to talk about something we talked about last week because I actually went back and did a little bit of research. And this was from Jennifer. Um, she had asked, I think it was Jennifer, that had asked if uh, how I felt about um, Florida HB 1239, which is House Bill 1239. And I told her at the time I wasn't overly concerned about it because it takes so long to get things through the government and we had lots of time to work with. Well, apparently I was very wrong. So I just want that to go on record. I was wrong. Um, it's already been signed by the governor. So it passed the House and the Senate in record time. I have no idea how this got done so quickly. But what House Bill 39 was about, and the reason she was bringing it up, is because it had to do with staffing standards in nursing homes. So um, I was familiar with the concept of the bill, but I really hadn't had time to, to dive into it. So I did a little bit of research um, after our last live session last week, and I found out a couple of things. Um, and I am not a lawyer. I am not uh, qualified to interpret the law as it's written, but what I did, I printed it off. I've got it right here. This is it. And I went through it and um, there is a need for this. Okay. And, and I want to start off by saying that I understand the need for it. I do. Um, we need to make sure that we have adequate staffing to take care of the patients that we have in long-term care. So I understand the need for it. I also understand that um, it allowed for, it, it, it put a provision in the statutes for paid feeding attendants, which is good because that frees the CNAs up to do more higher level type care. So paid feeding assistance is good. Um, and that requires 12 hours of training. Um, and, but it has a new thing that I was not familiar with at all. And I'm very intrigued and very um, concerned at the same time. So part of, at the very, very end of this, I mean, the last part of this statute, it talks about patient care attendants. And this is a brand new thing. And I don't know how it's going to shake out. I don't know what the long-term effects of this are. But I understand the reason behind it, because right now we have a horrible CNA shortage. I mean, there's just we have people in facilities that can't get care, even though they're paying to be there because there's not enough caregivers to go around. So the way the Florida um, Senate is, a, is approaching this is instead of focusing on education and training and getting people certified, they kind of did an end run and said, okay, well, we won't require that they're certified anymore. They just need 16 hours of training and they can do these specific tasks. So, um, and they can only work for this one nursing facility and it has to be a pathway to certification. It also opened up the opportunity to allow long-term care facilities to train in-house without any other additional um, oversight or uh, getting their license uh, or their um, program accredited or anything like that. So I think that it's, you know, they've got some really good things in there to help lighten the load reduce the shortage of available caregivers. I think they're on the right track. I am a little bit concerned, to be honest with you. I mean, this is as a nurse from way back. I am a little bit concerned about having so many uncertified individuals when you're talking about feeding assistance and patient care attendants, and some places have something called hospitality aids, and you've got all of these un certified caregivers at the bedside, 
Um, I'm kind of afraid that things are going to get missed and um, it's not going to work out quite the way that they, they expect it to. It's a lot for a nurse to try to have to manage because the nurse has to oversee all of this. And the nurse is busy passing medications and writing orders and calling doctors and arranging um, for tests and interp- you know, and uh, getting the test results and um, giving treatments and all of those things that the nurses have to do. And then to have to oversee all of these uncertified individuals as well is, is I think, asking a lot of nurses that are already overworked. So I'm a little concerned about that aspect of it. Um, I think that there's, like I said, good points and bad points to this. I think that time will tell over time how it's going to all play out. It may be the answer we were looking for. It's a, That's a possibility. Absolutely. It may run perfectly smooth and Patients get the care they need and caregivers get a pathway to certification and CNAs get the much needed help they need at the bedside. I'm really hoping that's the way it goes. We'll see. Time will tell. Um, But so here in Florida, we do have a brand new classification called patient care attendant. Um, I will be uh, contacting the Agency for Healthcare Administration, which is what's going to oversee this for the rulemaking part of this um, to try to find out what that is going to encompass and um, see if maybe we can create a training program for that pathway. We'll see how that works out. But um, it's very intriguing. And I'm certainly very, very happy that, um, and I believe it was Jennifer last week, that she brought this up and brought it to my attention so that I could look into it. So, um, so thank you very much. I don't see Jennifer in here today. So let's see who's here. Let's see. Um, Denise, I already said hi. Yvette, hi. Oh, I like the sunflower. Uh, Gloria says hi. Uh, Tahir, hello. Um, Gloria says good to see you. Well, thank you, Gloria. I'm very, very happy to be here with you guys today. Um, wait until you hear about my morning. Miss Fate, hello. Watching from the Middle East. That is awesome. Very good. Um, Welcome. I'm so happy to see you. Hamza. Hi, Hamza. Um, Denise says, everyone, please hit the like button. Oh, thank you, Denise. That is super sweet. Thank you so much. Um, And uh, Miss Fate says she's a CNA or there. Yeah, Miss Fate is a CNA student here in the Middle East. Very good. I wonder how different the training is in the Middle East versus here. Yvette says, question, when taking the CNA exam here in Florida, will we have mouth care on the exam? I'm asking because of COVID. I heard they're not doing it right now. Just checking. Yvette, that is a fantastic question. And I hesitate to give an answer to that because the answer may change today. I don't know. But as of last week, that is my most recent information. As of last week, um, they were not performing mouth care, denture care, and feeding because those skills required that the patient, and it's a live, those are all live patient skills, that the patient must be unmasked. So because of that, they were, those three skills were on kind of a temporary hold. Now, because the mask mandate at a federal level was lifted by the judge this week, I'm expecting that to trickle down. Um, And here in Florida, our governor is very, um, uh, doesn't like all of the mandates. So I would imagine that those three skills are going to go back on um, very, very shortly if they haven't already. So I would honestly prepare as if you're going to get them because, you know, your career doesn't stop on testing day. You don't get through testing, go, woo, thank God. Um, no, you get through testing day and you're like, okay, I'm ready to go. So remember on the other side of testing day are patients and you're really, truly going to have to brush patients' teeth and perform denture care, and feed patients, um, even with COVID. So we have to understand that we're perfecting these skills, getting really comfortable with them, not for the test, but for the day after the test when we actually go to work on these real life humans. So even though you may know in the back of your head, yeah, this may not be tested during 
my testing experience, it may, because it may go back on. But even if you're thinking, well, I don't have to practice this because it may not be tested, I would caution you on that. Because remember, you're not practicing for the test. You are practicing for when you go to work. So make sure you're perfecting those skills, whether or not they're going to be tested, you need to know them. Okay. I hope that helps. Um, let's see here. Ida says seven minutes late, but I'm here. It's your off day. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for joining us on your day off, man. You could be outside in the sun at the pool. Um, I'm very happy to have you here though. Hi, Blue. Um, Tenacious says hi from Michigan. Hi. And Jennifer's here. Hey, Jennifer. Um, she says, yeah, I don't think it was me that was asking about that. Oh, okay. I'm not real sure who it was then. <laughs> I, um, I've got you down for med tech and then I've got HB written next to it. So I'm, I'm not sure, but somebody asked, um, I did look into it and, uh, Tanisha says, and I might be, um, saying your name wrong. I'm so sorry if, if I am, but Tanisha says the skills are changing here in Michigan. Now that's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Thank you for the heads up. Blue says in Florida, what's the difference between a sterile and non-sterile procedure as far as a CNA home care aid is concerned? Um, okay, that's a very good question. And in Florida, CNAs do not perform sterile technique, especially in a home care setting. There are very, very, very few circumstances where a CNA can be trained in sterile technique. Um, it's very, very rare and requires a lot of additional hoops to jump through. But there are no instances that I am aware of that CNAs or home health aides are um, permitted to perform st any sterile procedures in a home care setting. Now, there is a difference between sterile and clean. And I, I want to take a minute to explain this. So when we are doing peri care or cares is how most of you um, talk about it. When we are doing personal care on the genitals of any patient, we are going to use clean technique, which means that we need to make sure that our gloves are clean before they touch the patient. So you don't want to put your gloves on, do a whole bunch of stuff and then go to the patient. You need to put your gloves on right before you start the actual cleaning. Keep your gloves clean for the patient. You also want to make sure that you're not reusing the same area of the washcloth over and over. So these are considered clean techniques. They are not sterile techniques. There is a big difference. Learning sterile technique is advanced nursing practice. So it's not something that's generally allowed at the CNA level. I hope that helps. Um, Gloria says, I love the lipstick. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I, I got to tell you guys, I was putting my makeup on before I came live and I had makeup in my eye and, um, it's watering now, like really bad is <laughs> probably getting red. Um, and I was trying to put the lipstick on and the lipstick, cause I never, ever, ever wear it. So it's drying out and it's like the gloss stuff. So I was trying to put the lipstick on and I couldn't see cause my eye was watering. So I'm sure it's like all over the place, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm a mess. I'm not a makeup girl. I'm just not, I have to put it on to come do this live thing, but I am not a makeup girl. Um, so let's see here. Uh, Blue says, how would a CNA home care aide know if what's being asked regarding this? Let's see here. Uh, how would a CNA home care aide know if what's being asked? Oh, if they're in over their head. Okay. So it's very, very simple, Blue. If they haven't been trained, they cannot do it, period, in a discussion. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. So if, so CNAs and home health aides can do whatever they were trained to do in their training program because a training program will cover allowable skills. Now, the employer, employer can delegate additional skills, but the employer is responsible for providing the training for those skills. So either you learn to do it in your training program, or you are trained by your employer to take on this additional task. 
if you haven't been trained in one of these two areas, you simply can't do it. And like I said, sterile technique is not something that is generally allowed by CNAs and it's never allowed in a home care setting. Okay. So if they don't know how to do it, they're over their head. It's pretty much that easy. So Tanisha says no mouth care, no feeding here in Michigan because of COVID. Yeah. Tanisha, and that's kind of everywhere right now is, is that's the feedback that I'm getting is that there's no mouth care and there's no feeding and there's no denture care during the state exam. But please remember, because that federal judge did lift that mask mandate at the federal level, that's going to trickle down to all of us. So um, I know there's a challenge right now. We're waiting to kind of hear how that's all going to shake out. But don't be surprised if in the next couple of days that um, restriction gets lifted and we go back to business as usual during testing. So prepare as if you're going to do it. And then if it doesn't show up on the state exam, whew, good. You get a bonus. <laughs> OK, Um so let's see here. Blue says, I'm keeping my mouth shut regarding Florida's governor. I get into too much trouble when I get my two cents, LOL. Yeah, I know. Um, I try not to get into politics on this at all. Um, I'm not a very political person. I try to even stay off of like my personal Facebook because it gets me in trouble. Um, but, you know, I think that everybody is trying their best to manage a very difficult situation. And we all have different, you know, different viewpoints and different ways we think that um, it should be handled. And that's kind of what makes us an interesting society, right? Um, so eh, we'll just go with it. Um, Bertha says, hi, Bertha. Hello, Miss Patty. I love your videos. I'm getting ready for my star exams already on Monday. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. This is my first time becoming a CNA and I love it. Thank you so much. Bertha, you are the reason that we are here. Um, we love working with students and we want to welcome you into healthcare. Please stop by and let us know how you do so we can congratulate you. Yvette says, thanks. <laughs> Stella says, hi, Nurse Patty. How are you today? Stella, I am fantastic. And let me tell you why. I'm just, I'm bursting here, guys. I'm bursting. Um, this morning, my husband and I got up and we drove over to Orlando. It's about a two hour drive. And the reason that we went to Orlando early in the morning was to pick up this. I got the card games in the actual card games, the ones that I developed that I put so much time and energy in and, uh, we ordered them. So the card game, there's two decks in each box. They're not separate. It's all one game. They just package them like this. So they come wrapped in cellophane like this and you just take them out of the cellophane and you shuffle them all together because they're one deck of cards, but they're like real cards, like real playing cards. They're slippery. I mean, they are really, really, really slippery and you can shuffle them and they're just like real playing cards. And I am so excited and it's, um, I mean, the, the printing on it is fantastic. The graphics are great. I am just, I mean, look at that. That's just so nice, right? I am so excited about this. Um, and we were able to get them today. And I just got home like an hour before I went live with you guys. So, um, but the, the one of the women that works in the, the place, we, we got it from a place called Shuffled Inc. And they are fantastic. They do um, actual real card games for companies all over. And I, I remember I said, I'm not very political. Well, this is one area where I kind of am. Okay. When I was looking to have these done, I could have gone with a company over in China and it was a little bit cheaper, but it took a lot longer. Now I found this place and they're local. They're right here in my state and they were a little bit more money. And I really, really struggled with that. I mean, I'm a very small business guys. I, I, I I'm a very, I, I, it's really hard for me to order 500 decks of cards that took out a huge chunk of my savings. So um, I really had to struggle with this. You know, do I go overseas where it's a little bit cheaper or do I keep my money local? And I decided to take a leap of faith and I kept my money local. And I'm so glad I did because these guys were 
fantastic to work with. Fantastic. But one of the ladies that was there, she said, you know, it's funny because my sister is a CNA and I showed her this and she absolutely loved it. But what she said was really interesting because she actually kind of looked through all of the cards. She said that she works for a major hospital group there. And she said that when people come in for interviews, they ask them certain patient care type questions. And it was amazing because a lot of these people that were interviewing positions didn't have the answers. And yet she said that almost all of the questions that are asked are answered on these cards. She was so impressed with that. So it, it was a really, um, really neat endorsement. And I hadn't seen the cards yet. So I was really excited. So I thought that was really, really cool. Yes, we are selling the cards. I know somebody just asked. We are selling the cards. I have them on my website. I just put them up now. And you guys get a coupon. So do you see that? I just put it in the in the um, the chat for you. You guys, you guys, because you're here with me every week and I'm super excited. And I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love you guys. So we are giving you $10 off. Now, normally I sell these for $29.99 because like I said, it's expensive, right? Um, expensive for me to have printed. So I sell this whole deck, the card, the whole thing for $29.99. You guys... Because you are here with me, you're my YouTube crew, you're going to get $10 off. So 20 bucks, 20 bucks. Um, and it is an awesome game. So what you do, so somebody just asked, um, and I'm going to make a video on how to play it, but I'll give you a really quick rundown. Okay. So there are sets. So you see, I know it's backwards, guys. I'm sorry. But do you see how that, and it's blurry. See how that says resonant rights? OK, there's a set. So this says one out of 10. That means there's 10 cards in this set. Resonant right. Set of 10. Uh, closing. One of nine. So set of nine. Shoe rolls. Eight. So set of eight. So what you want to do is um, collect one or more sets. So you deal it out. Eight people or I'm sorry, eight cards to each person. You deal it out. Put the deck in the middle with one card up. The next person can either take that discard or draw a card, either one. And then they're going to discard a card and it goes around the circle. And then you got some specialty cards, which we looked at this one, Care Plan Catastrophe. Um, that's a that's a specialty card. This is another one, Need a Helping Hand. So you've got some specialty cards in there, and uh, which really makes it fun. So you want to collect these sets. Now, these sets are all the principles that I talk about in my training, right? Remember um, when we are, are washing something, we check the water, they check the water. Um, whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry, right? All those principles that we learned in, in that I talk about all the time are in these sets. So you collect the sets and the first person to collect an entire set of seven or more cards wins. That's it. But everybody else that's caught with a crappy caregiver in their hand, because crappy care, you got to get rid of those crappy caregivers. Anybody else that's caught with that crappy caregiver in their hands, that counts as a point against them. So you, you end up playing a couple of, of different um, hands of this until somebody reaches 40 points and that wins the whole game. And it's just a ton of fun to play. And you'd, you'd be surprised at how much strategy is in here. There's a lot of strategy. And um, what's really exciting about it is that those specialty cards and the wilds can be used in a couple of different ways. Now, I'm going to make a video on this. Um, the video will go up uh, sometime probably next week that explains how to how to play the game, how it works. Um, but I'm just super excited over this. I can't even tell you guys. I've worked so hard on this game and it is so much fun. We got some prototypes in and I handed them out to a whole bunch of people and we got great feedback. I changed a few things and then we had them printed on the actual card decks and man, makes all the difference in the world. So the way that you order, somebody asked, how do you order? Just go on to that link that I put on there. Um, Go on to that link, put it in your cart. And it's going to have a coupon code area. Just put YT crew. So it's all caps YT for YouTube crew. You're my YouTube crew. And that'll get you that discount. OK. All right. So super, super, super fun. Um, let's see here. 
Uh, in content says watching from Dubai. Oh, thank you. Um, Stella, hi. Uh, Peace says, I look great. Oh, thank you, Peace. Tracy says, hello, dear. I'm new here and happy to be watching from the UAE. Wow. We've got a lot of people um, from Dubai and the UAE. So welcome. Stella says, please, what is a good course to enhance our CNA certificate? Stella, that's a great question. And it's one that I'm actually going to be talking about in the next two weeks um, because it's a question I get a lot. You know, what should I get next? Should I get a med tech? Should I get my EKG? Should I get phlebotomy? What should I do next? And we're going to talk about that in about two weeks. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Jennifer says, I listen to the show when I'm outside doing other tasks. Speaker phone comes in handy. Yes. <laughs> Mayla says, watching from Saipan. Wow. How exciting. Lou says, here in Washington, denture care, yes, because you can use fake dentures, mouth care, no. But some sites have fake mouths, like a dental student used for training. Foot care, yes. We resorted to fake feet at the moment. <laughs> yeah, here in uh, prometric testing, they don't use um, mannequins for those skills. It has to be a live person. And uh, Jennifer, yes, the card game is for sale and up and ready to go now. Peace says, is it because of the cards that you're glowing? Probably. You wouldn't believe how much I put into this and how exciting this is. I know. I'm a little bit nerdy, guys. I'm sorry. I can't help it. Um, but yeah, I'm just so excited over this. And um, let's see here. Uh, amazing. Thank you. Put in the code. Um, Christy says, awesome. Just started my online CNA. That's fantastic, Christy. Best of luck. Tanya says, hi, Patty. I passed my CNA last month and just received the certification from Red Cross for BLS, CPR, and first aid for healthcare workers. I plan to undergo sterilization techniques next, thanks to you. Well, thank you, Tanya. That is awesome. Very, very good. Yeah, that uh, sterile processes. Um, I actually started my career in that. Now, a lot of you guys don't know where I got my start. I actually went to work at a hospital in purchasing. So at 18 years old, I had a multi-million dollar budget and I was buying stuff for the hospital, which was a super cool job for an 18 year old. Um, but our sister department was sterile processing. This is where you sterilize all the instruments and do surgical packs that get sent to surgery for different um, surgeries. And they were short staffed. Well, my boss um, said, you know, you really do need to uh, cross train in this department so I can use you in there. And OK, I'll learn. Sure. No problem. But in order to get that position, I had to be certified. So I had to go through the, the training, the CNA training to get certified to be able to work in sterile processing. And that's how I got my start was in sterile processing. Um, they kind of got mad at me because I kept asking, well, why do you need 16 different scissors? Why are some curved? Why are some straight? Why are some short? Why are some long? And, and I just drove them nuts. So they all got together and helped me get into LPN school, I think, just to get out of their department because I was driving them insane. Um, so that's how I ended up in LPN school. And then later on, I went into RN. And here I am with you. It's been one heck of a journey and I wouldn't trade any of it. So let's get on to today's lesson. <laughs> I know I, I've been over so much with you. We talked about HB 1239. We talked about the card game. Um, but let's talk about what we were here to talk about today. And that is preceptors. Um, this was something that Tanya brought up uh, two weeks ago, I think, asking about preceptors. And I think that this is an important topic. So I want to cover this from three different angles. The first is when you are orienting and you are assigned to work with a preceptor, what are some things that you should be focusing on? What are things that you can do to help this relationship grow? And what are things that you should be um, expecting during that orientation process? Then I want to talk about um, from the preceptor's point of view, what can you do to help this new orientee along? And finally, what are things that you can do to become a preceptor if this is something that appeals to you? So let's talk about the orientee first. So you're brand new. 
you get a job at a local nursing home. We'll just pick on a nursing home. And they tell you, okay, be here Monday at 8 a.m., be in scrubs. You sit in a classroom for like four hours, learn about um, where to clock in, who human resources is, where to park, and all that kind of stuff. And then they partner you up with a stranger, somebody you don't know. And they tell you this person is going to be your preceptor for the next two weeks. And you're like, my who? What, my what? what? What am I supposed to do with this? What that person is there to do is help bridge the gap because you're new. You don't even know where the washcloths are yet. And you have to learn a lot of things before we can let you loose all by yourself. So some of the things that you need to learn are where do you get the supplies? What are the processes that are in place for that particular facility? For instance, we talked last week about CHG wipes and the purple pack bed wipes. So in a hospital, bed baths are not given with a basin, washcloth, soap, towel. We don't use those. In a hospital setting, bed baths are given with prepackaged wipes that are kept in a warmer. That is their policy and procedure. So you would be trained, okay, in this setting, this is how we give bed baths. So you have to learn how things are done, their processes. Now, a policy and procedure manual is good for this. It, you know, you should take an hour to go through your policy and procedure manual to familiarize yourself with it. But in reality, it's kind of dry and boring and you'll drift off after about 15 minutes. So it's always um, a little bit more engaging to work with directly with somebody that has this knowledge. So instead of trying to read it on a piece of paper, they can tell you, OK, here, this is what we're doing. OK, so. When you're working with a preceptor, it's really important that you listen closely to what they're saying and how they're showing you to do things. And you don't want to take this attitude in with you that, you know, I know what I'm doing. You're doing it all wrong. And I don't want to listen to anything you have to say because this is somebody that you're going to be working with. Now, if you start the relationship off adversarial, Later on, when you need their help, they're not going to be likely to help you because you didn't, you made them feel unappreciated, right? So start off on the right foot. If you feel like maybe what they're telling you is not correct or it's contrary to the way that you learn to do it, either in school or somewhere else, then ask to see the policy and procedure on that particular task. So going back to the hospital real quick. So you go into the hospital, you're assigned a preceptor. A preceptor says, here, we don't give bed baths with base and soap and washcloths. We use this, right? And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, that is so not what I learned in school. This is completely just wrong. You're wrong. That is not how you give a bed bath. You have to have a base and soap and washcloths and, and, you know, you're, you're like adversarial about this. Instead of being like that, say, can we look at the policy and procedure, please? So I can familiarize myself with it. That's not how I was trained. So I need to familiarize myself. They'll get the policy and procedure book out. You'll look it up. And if they're wrong, they'll be able to see according to their policy where they're going wrong at, but chances are they're not. They're probably right. It's just a different policy than what you were trained on previously. And that's okay. So make sure that when you are the trainee, that you're listening to what your preceptor is telling you. And if it doesn't sound right, now sometimes it may not be right. Because, guys, this is kind of like a giant game of telephone, right? Right? That preceptor was trained by somebody else when they were new. And that preceptor was trained by somebody else when they were new. And it's like a, a giant game of telephone that, you know, whatever it is they're telling you may have gotten diluted through the, the chain. So if you don't think it sounds right, just ask to look it up in the policy and procedure manual. And that way you can verify it and everybody's on the same page. So as a trainee, make sure you're listening, but also make sure that you're participating. I've seen a lot of orientees, people that are coming on, they just want to stand behind the preceptor, let the preceptor do all the work and just stand there and watch. 
That's not how this is supposed to go. The best way to be trained is see one, do one, teach one. That's the best way to train. So you can watch the preceptor do something once. Then you need to be doing it with your preceptor watching you. Okay. That's the best way to train. If you just want to stand back for two weeks and watch somebody else work, that's not going to get you anywhere. You got to get in there. You got to get your hands dirty. So make sure you go into this with the right mindset. I'm going to listen. I'm going to validate with the policy and procedure book, and I'm going to participate. All of those are very, very valuable um, assets and orientees. Now, as a preceptor, so let's say that you're the one precepting. This is not an easy job, okay? Preceptors are responsible for passing on information that they know is correct. So if a preceptor is doing something the way they've always done it, but they're not entirely sure that, you know, that's what the policy and procedure says, before you start precepting, you better know that policy and procedure book inside and out. You've got an obligation to pass on correct information. So you've got to be really strong in your skills and in your own knowledge. But you also don't want to come across as a know-it-all. Oh, this is the way we do it here. And however you did it before, we don't want to hear about it. That's not that again, that's not the right attitude to go into this with. So if you're a preceptor, you may want to say something like, I understand that that's the way that you were taught in school. However, here, our policy and procedure is a little bit different. Now, I don't know why our facility wants it a different way, but they do. Let me show you how this is going to be done here. So that's a much better way to um, approach this. So as a preceptor, you also need to listen. You need to listen to the concerns of your orientee. If they say to you, well, I just... Um, you know, I don't understand this, or there's no way I can do all of this, or I feel very insecure in my own skill level here. You need to be listening to this and reporting that to your supervisor as well, so that we can make sure that we're giving them enough time to get acclimated for success. If you're just rushing your way through because you don't want a precept, you don't want somebody shadowing you, you're just, you know, you got too much to do. And you're not telling your, your supervisors what's happening here. And you're like, okay, they're good to go on their own. Just, just get them off of me. I, I just want to go do my job. That person, that orientee is probably going to fail. Now, why do we care? Well, we care because that leaves us short staffed again. So if we really want to address the staffing issue, we've got to make sure that we've got really good preceptors in place that make sure that our orientees are well-trained and comfortable and accepted. So another part of the preceptor's job outside of skills is to make sure that the orientee feels accepted as part of the team. So if you're the preceptor that's in the break room complaining about your orientee, oh my gosh, she is like the worst. That's just causing division. So the, the preceptor really is the bridge between the new kid and the group, right? The, the team. You've got to introduce this orientee in and make sure that they feel welcome and comfortable and that they are um, acclimating to the team as well. And that is so important, incredibly important. The other thing that you have to make sure is that the orientee understands the nuances of each individual patient. Now we're all different people, right? Me, I like to sleep in, man. If I have to get up before eight o'clock in the morning, I get grouchy. Give me some coffee. I like to sleep in. My husband, on the other hand, he's an early bird. He's up at like 530 in the morning. He's crazy, um, right? We're different people. Well, you've got patients in a clinical setting that are all different. They have different likes and dislikes. They have different circadian rhythms. They have different ways that they like things done. So you need to make sure that um, your 
orientee is not just familiar with the processes, what we're doing, we also have to be familiar with the patients that we're doing them on. So if you're in a long-term care facility, this is going to take a little bit of time to um, get to know Henry and Harry and Charlie and Vivian and Elsa and whoever else is in there so that the patients become familiar with this new caregiver as well. So normalizing this event for the patients is a very big part of what the preceptor is going to do because the patient's familiar with that preceptor. They've been there. They're a fixture there. The patient isn't going to be familiar with this new guy. That's scary. New is scary for patients. So you are the familiar bridge that's going to make it okay for them to work with this new guy. So preceptors have a very, very important role here, making sure that we're passing on correct information. We know the policies and procedures inside and out. We um, are directing our orientee. We're being a bridge between the orientee and the team that we're reporting off to our supervisors where the orientee is and how they're functioning and that we're introducing the orientee to the patients and making the patients feel comfortable with the new kid. Okay. Now, if all of this sounds interesting to you and you want to take on that leadership role, then you need to let your supervisors know I'm interested in becoming a preceptor. And the problem is that very few people step up and say, I'm interested in being a preceptor that I, I would like to take on that role. So when the facility hires somebody new, they just kind of stick them with anybody that's working that day. And these are people that don't know what it's like to be a preceptor. Now they're stuck with the new kid and, and it, it just becomes a very bad experience for everybody involved. So if you feel like this is something that might be up your alley, then make sure you let your supervisors know, I would like to be a preceptor. They're not going to go out searching for preceptors, but they need good ones. So, because your supervisors, they're just, they're, they're busy with so many other things. So if you want to be a preceptor, you need to make sure that your employers know that, Hey, I know we need new, good people here. And I know that you're hiring people. I would be like to be available for shadowing or training. And your supervisor will absolutely fall in love with you because it's really hard to get good preceptors. Um, so remember that everybody in this, in this uh, team has a role to play. So orientees need to be open and they need to be willing to change how they do things to the new way that the, the new facility wants it done. Preceptors, you need to be good guides and be patient. And supervisors need to be aware of who wants to be a preceptor and listen to the feedback of that preceptor for this whole thing to work properly. But can you imagine in a perfect world? I just want you to think about that for a second. Imagine a perfect world out there, right? Where you've got new CNAs coming in that feel welcome and feel like they're going to contribute um, professionally. You've got preceptors that want those new people in and train them very well and make them feel welcome and provide that bridge. And there's no clicks and everybody gets along and we're fully staffed. I mean, that's a fairy tale, isn't it? That's a fairy tale. But the thing is, you actually have a role to play in that fairy tale. And it is attainable as long as we're all playing our roles right. I hope that helps. I hope that helps, guys. Um, Kim says, peace and love, Miss Patty. Absolutely enjoy your channel. I believe you're called for the season. I would agree with that 100%, Kim. Um, I am purpose built for the life I lead, 100%. Um, I absolutely love what I do. And I'm so glad that you guys come along for the ride. Um, you trust and believe it's going to pay off. Oh, thank you, Kim. I, I do appreciate that. Jody says, what is your take on a trainer telling you to place five pads, two briefs on a patient on third shift? That is their policy. Ugh. 
So the first thing I would say is, can I see the policy and procedure book, please? <laughs> um, and the second thing I would do is maybe start applying elsewhere because that tells me right there. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, okay, five pads, two briefs on a patient on third shift. What this says is that we are not changing patients overnight. So they're putting five pads on the bed just in case they leak. They're putting two briefs on the, the patient to catch whatever's coming out of them. And they're going to leave them all night. But the problem is that adult urine is not like baby urine. Baby urine is very mild because they're on a controlled diet. I mean, all they eat is, you know, strained peaches and, and rice cereal, right? There's nothing acidic in there at all. So their urine, very, very mild. You can put a diaper on a baby, put them to sleep, wake up the next morning. They'll still have skin on their tush. No problem because their urine is mild. Adult urine is not. Adult urine is very acidic and acid held against the skin will eat into the skin. It will also cause rashes and skin problems and wounds and, and UTIs and all kinds of just horrible, horrible, horrible things. So a lot of times caregivers will try to take these shortcuts. They'll double brief. They'll put lots of pads. They won't wake. And, and they, they say to themselves, well, I want my patient to be able to rest throughout the night. I don't want to wake them up because they're so tired or whatever excuse they want to use. And that's all it is, is an excuse. So the patient ends up paying the price here because this, the skin of the patient is going to suffer. They're also going to be at risk for urinary tract infections, for yeast infections. Guys, think about the ideal breeding environment for pathogens, warm, dark, moist. The inside of a brief is all three. It's warm because it's holding in body heat. It's dark because it's blocking light. It's moist because of the urine. I mean, you can't get a better breeding environment for pathogens. So you're going to end up with fungal infections and yeast infections and all kinds of really nasty things. Now, the CNA may think they're doing the right thing, but they're coming at this with incomplete knowledge. So my response to this is, I'm so sorry. Can I see the policy and procedure book on that? I just want to, I'm not familiar with that policy. I've never done it that way. I just want to read the policy to make sure that I'm in compliance with what the facility wants. That's exactly how I would handle that. And then when I left shift that day, I'd probably start applying somewhere else. Because if, the, if these people are getting away with this, that means that you have management that does not care. And you don't want to be in a place like that. Now, those of you, I want to talk directly to any nurses I have on here. Those of you who are watching who are managers, do not let your staff get away and slide on these things because they're influencing the next generation of CNAs. But more importantly, they are putting your patients at risk and you are going to be the one liable for that. Don't let your staff get away with this. Don't let it happen. Those are our patients they're all of our patients, and we have an obligation to make sure that they're cared for properly. So make sure that if you do leave that facility, make sure they know why. I would absolutely point that out. Okay, this is what your third shift is doing, and I want no part of that, none. And that because it's been going on for so long, that tells me that management around here is not attentive, and they don't pay attention to what's happening, and they're not responsive to the problems in the patient. And I feel like my talents are going to be wasted in a place like this. So I'm going to leave. Be very honest with them because nothing's going to change unless something changes and you can be the force of that change. Okay. All right. Imarachi, hi. How am I doing? I am fantastic today. Charlene says, I really like to watch your live because you know what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much, Charlene. I really appreciate that. All right, guys, we have gone way over time today. I'm so sorry to keep you too late. But um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I do apologize because I just got back. I do not have the uh, shout outs for those that graduated. I'm very sorry, guys. Those of you who graduated, congratulations. I'm super, super proud of you. But stay tuned next week because I will have my list and I will read out everybody's name that um, 
passed the state exam this week and was successful, I will read them out next week. I'm so sorry I didn't get to it this week. But um, I hope you guys join me again next week, next Thursday at three, as usual, right here on the channel. In the meantime, if you get a chance, go over and take a look at the um, card game here. I'll put it in there again. Um, take a look at the card game. Remember your very special coupon code is Y T C R E W Y T crew. You're my YouTube crew. Um, and that is your special discount code. Um, I hope that, uh, you guys have a really wonderful week. It is spring and, um, Weather is not so bad out there. Well, not where I'm at anyway. Um, so I hope you guys join me again next week and I'll see you then. Until next time, happy caregiving.